and thank you very much. My name is Lucas Taggart Atkinson, and I'm speaking on behalf of RollUp.js. So I think it is fair to say that RollUp is one of the foundations that Beat is built upon. And when I was invited, there was at least one person who expected me to shed a little more light on this relationship. And yes, I will talk about that a bit later. First, I want to talk about something else entirely, but bear with me, it will be relevant for Veed as well. What I want to talk about is a very old roll-up bug that we had for quite some time, and it is this one. Chunk hashes should be based on the output. It's from May 2019. As you see, it's still open, and yes, it is kind of critical. It is critical enough so that uh, one well-known Google developer advocate was really making a great case that Rollup's plugin system is superior to the alternatives, was citing it as the, the most important issue he found with Rollup. Hashing happens at the wrong time, which can lead to bad caching. And um, what is this all about? So to understand that, you need to understand content-based file names. So the idea is that we use file names that have something that we call a hash of the content in its name so that they are unique identifiers for their content. So in this example, I have a chunk that dynamically imports two other chunks. Now, if I were to change something in the upper right chunk, let's say we are logging something else, then this would mean the hash of that chunk would change. That means the import in the main chunk on the left would also change, which would also lead the hash of the main chunk to change, and um, that is it. So why is this important? Why do we want to do that? If we have file names as unique identifiers, we can configure our servers to use a very long caching time, so that the browser cache retains the files basically indefinitely, and they don't need to be pulled again from the server while we still have the ability to deploy at any time because changing the content means changing the file name, with the advantage that in this example, the lower right chunk, which is unchanged, can still be taken from the cache. So this sounds kind of straightforward, but what happens if you have circular references, which is not too uncommon? So um, imagine you are using um, some routing solution, then usually the router will dynamically import other chunks when you change pages, while the other chunks all reference the router. So you have a circular reference between the router and all other chunks. So in my example, I'm just having dynamic imports between my two chunks. How do I create a hash for that when the content of the file would depend on the hash of the other file? One approach could be to say, okay, then we hash everything except the hash of the other file. And the way Rollup2 does this is just hashing the original files with the original import targets in place. So in my examples, we are using emojis as hashes because it's kind of easier to see and um, you don't have to memorize um, numbers and letters. And then what we do is we're basically creating a dependency graph of hashes. So in, the, in this example, we know that the apple chunk is kind of referencing the broccoli chunk. So the hash of the apple chunk should be apple plus broccoli is fish in my example, while the hash of the other chunk is broccoli plus apple because it happens in the wrong order and in the reverse order, which say it's my squiddy hash. And then as a last step, we are replacing the imports again with the actual chunk names. Now these chunk, these hashes are indeed very fishy. Why are they fishy? Because um, we want to have a minification step in our setup. And minification cannot happen before we change the imports because after minification, we would not find the import again. Everything has moved around. We need to repass the entire file and it's still maybe possible that stuff is missing or done in an entirely different way. So what happens is that Roller runs the render chunk plugin hook after that, which changes the content, but it cannot change the hash. And now we have different files that have the same hash, which basically breaks all assumptions we have for content-based 
caching. So this algorithm is kind of easy to implement. It handles cycles, but one drawback was that we had the original file names in the content hashes, which is bad because if I rename the file, the output would not change, but the hash would change. And the big problem is that chunk transformations by plugins are not in a position to change hashes. So how can we solve this issue? Well, let's go back to the first step because that's what we're doing in Rollup 3. So assume you have two chunks referring to each other. So I said, okay, we wanted to have a, um, a hash that contains everything but the chunk hash. And we wanted to run render chunk first. So what we're doing is we're replacing everything with placeholders. The placeholders have a number, the number corresponds to the chunk. So the left is kind of chunk one and the right one is chunk two. Then we directly run the render chunk hook, which does its magic. So in this example, it just changes the logging, but it could be anything. It could even change the import or remove the import entirely. And because we don't make assumptions what render chunk does, the next step, we're just doing a full text search to find all placeholders in the output. So then we find our dependencies. So we see the chunk one, except for the content of one, it also depends on placeholder two and vice versa for the other chunk. Then we to get a content hash, we replace all placeholders with a default placeholder because those numbers one, two, they aren't necessarily stable. They can kind of depend on, on some race conditions. So then we get a stable content only hash. And as a last step, we're now calculating the final hashes, which gives me a pair and an orange hash. And we solve the issue we originally had. So yes, we have very stable hashes that only depend on content. We can have arbitrary file transformations in render chunk that add imports, remove imports. And due to the nature, of this, we now have a cool new feature in our render chunk hook, which will also benefit Vite plugins, which is we get the entire chunk graph available. So there's a new fourth parameter to render chunk, which basically contains a list of all chunks with their imports, exports, and how they're related. And now this is really cool. And we also got very good feedback from the V developers that it allows them to remove a lot of complexity from Veed, and that's good. It makes Veed happy. But the question is, so we didn't do this for Veed. We did this because this is a serious bug, but how is our relationship actually with Veed? And more precisely, how do we feel about Veed? And if you look from the surface, <clears throat> asking Andrew, maybe we were slightly overwhelmed by the success of Veed, which also put a lot of new issues for Rollup, especially for the plugins. But if you go a little deeper, um, there is more to it. And to understand this, the question is, why did Veed choose Rollup in the first place? So to my understanding, um, one key reason was the plugin system. So if you reuse an existing plugin system that solves your purpose, you get access to a broad range of plugins, which means that users will be much more likely to adopt your solution because they already have ways to adapt them to their needs. On the other hand, if you develop an entirely new plugin system, there will be no plugins except for a few main one and then users will not go and you don't you also need the users to write new plugins another reason apparently was that rollup output is slightly smaller which is something that we pride upon i still think that rollup has one of the best tree shaking algorithms out there maybe except for closure compiler but it didn't look reasonably where they are and we are constantly working to make that better and we have apparently a more mature code splitting approach compared to ES build. So, and this is exactly where we wanted Rollup to be. Why did we want Rollup to be there? So a little more background going into my personal history. So Rollup was developed, as you may know, by Rich Harris. It was in 2015. And in 2017, I happened to create some pull requests to improve tree shaking, 
for reasons because I was interested in the topic and um, looking into roll-up sources, I found uh, some potential for improvement. And then I kind of became maintainer, which was like Rich saying, okay, this was very cool what you did here. Why not just merge your own stuff? Here are the access rights to the repository. And yes, after that point, he no longer merged my pull requests. So I gathered after two months, maybe I should merge my own pull requests. And then he also did no longer release anything. So I, I said, okay, maybe can you give me the publishing rights? And then I was basically maintainer. And that's history. I think it was good for Rich because he was already developing on Svelte at this time. But of course, being a maintainer means you have to make strategic decisions. Where should Rollup go? We do not have a large team. Most contributors are single-time contributors who want to have this feature or that feature. Uh, Guy Bedford was, uh, for a longer time, a regular contributor. That was very nice. Um, so the question is, what should we focus on? So one thing to focus on I decided should be core improvements. We don't want to expand roll-up scope lightly. We want to stick with the stuff that we already have. Um, and if we add a new feature, then we will really want to be sure that this is a feature we are going to maintain for a long time. So code splitting was one new thing we added. And there are lots of small features we added, but they are more making the picture, completing the picture than really expanding into new areas. Another thing is we do not expose internal stuff. This is, for instance, in contrast to Webpack, which allows you to basically plug everything, which is kind of cool for hacking, but it means that you cannot just easily do a new release because every change, every internal change can now break something. You cannot rename stuff, you cannot improve stuff easily, and we didn't want to be there. So by default, internal stuff is closed in Rollup to allow us to remain agile. Another thing we wanted to focus in is um, configurability. So we make very few assumptions about what Rollup is used for, which means that Rollup is used for many niche use cases, which is very important to us. So for instance, you can run Rollup in a browser. You cannot do this with many other bundlers, as far as I know. And we want to retain that ability. But most importantly, we have the plugin interface as a stable, well-documented first-class API. Um, what is missing on this list, maybe, is developer experience. And yes, developer experience is very important. It's also very important to us. But the thing is, if you want to focus on developer experience, you need to make assumptions about what Rollup is used for. And this kind of conflicts with some of the other goals here. Now, our hope was that maybe with the other decisions we made, um, third-party developers will step in and close that gap. And there was some success. So for instance, there was TSDX, which is a nice tool for um, zero config TypeScript library bundling, or similarly, microbundle from Jason Miller. And there are many other tools like this. And one thing we're also very proud of is Stencil, which is a web component framework. They don't really advertise it, but Stencil is built very much around Rollup. It's doing the heavy lifting here. And you can find it if you dig deep in the documentation that basically Rollup is at its core. But what WMR and especially Veet were doing, this was beyond my our wildest hopes. And of course, we support this. So how do you create a partnership? So we started including Veet and WMR developers early in plugin API extensions, asking for feedback, saying, OK, does this work for you? What do you want to do with this? Um, but also, Veet was really expanding on, on the API, adding new features. And we started basically porting some of their extensions into Rollup. So one example is the order attribute for plugins hooks, which is kind of a replacement for enforce because I think enforce is really solving an issue at the wrong level. But the main idea is that people should be able to write roller plugins instead of wheat plugins unless they really need to target wheat. So this brings us to the future. Where do you want to go from here? Um, of course, the next step is rollup three. And there are more nice features here. One thing maybe I want to mention is 
per chunk banner footer into outro. So there's an option that allows you to inject code at the top or bottom of each generated chunk. And with Rollup 3, you have now the ability to basically look into that chunk before you do that. And this is a really great way to add imports, exports, whatever, specialized logging, which will also automatically get source maps right, which is an important thing. And um, so I really recommend looking into this if you need this. Um, otherwise, source map handling has been improved. Default values have been improved, especially around uh, common JS interoperation. Um, and also we separate the, the browser build, which basically, basically cuts rollups install size uh, to less than a half. And what do we want to go from here? So as I said, we want to keep fo focusing on our strengths. This is, of course, tree shaking and code optimization and also code splitting. So one thing I promised really to work on next is to add an option to define a minimum chunk size target. This was requested by many people because apparently one issue is that you have a lot of very small chunks. And um, the solution I want to implement is to merge small chunks that do not have side effects into larger chunks with similar dependencies. Um, Rollup already knows if a chunk has side effects, so the analysis is there. We just need to implement a nice algorithm to figure out uh, how to do that so that you have very little overhead from this. Um, and another question, of course, is do we want to make Rollup faster? And of course, we want to do that. The thing is, like in the V documentation, it says, we won't rule out the possibility of using ES build for production builds when it stabilizes these features in the future. So ES build is really breathing up our necks here. And we want to stay the build tool for Vite, definitely. So yes, we are open to start converting roller parts to native code eventually. And if we do that, it will probably not be Go, it will likely be Rust because the tooling is very mature. And then we could use SWC as our parser which apparently exposes much of what we need as, as crates. And, no, but of course, we would need new contributors to pull this off. So if you are fluent in Rust and maybe know a little JavaScript, then maybe we can talk. I'm very happy to start new collaborations on this one. And this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, maybe you learned something otherwise. Um, maybe I could entertain you with our kids' car collection. Um, see you around.